As you might know, Kansas City has an incredibly strong sports culture. They got a ton of professional sports teams there. The Royals, the Chiefs, baseball, football, soccer, hockey, and even NASCAR. It's a city renowned for their sports, with hardcore fans who embrace their teams, and it's been like this for a very long time. Despite having pro teams for so many other sports, what about basketball? Why isn't there an NBA team in Kansas City, and did professional basketball ever establish a foundation in Kansas City? Actually, they did. At one point, Kansas City had an NBA team, and the fans loved it. For many seasons, they had one of the highest attendances in the entire league. But eventually, they were relocated to Sacramento, and not on good terms. Why did they relocate? How's it going folks? My name's Andy, and in the past, I've made videos talking about the relocation of several NBA franchises. This time, we're going to take a look at the incredibly controversial relocation from Kansas City to Sacramento. Without further ado, let's begin. First, let's set this whole stage from the very beginning. Before Kansas City, this team was actually located in Cincinnati, known as the Cincinnati Royals, which you might be more familiar with as Oscar Robertson played there for his first 10 seasons. They relocated to Kansas City in 1972, mostly due to the team trading away Robertson and Jerry Lucas. Because of that, their attendance plummeted, along with their revenue. It was common for teams back then to relocate due to lack of profits, and this was one of those cases. There wasn't too much else about it. From 1972 to 1975, the official name of the team was actually the Kansas City and Omaha Kings. However, by 1975, Omaha was not generating enough revenue to keep having games in Nebraska. So from 1975 to 1985, they would completely ditch the Omaha audience, and change their name to simply the Kansas City Kings. So in this 10-year stretch, the team was quite average to mediocre. They would win between 30 and 50 games every season and made the playoffs a few times, and even the conference finals. But it resulted in zero championships. However, the popularity of the team was quite high, especially for such a small market. When Kansas City opened the new Kemper Arena, it would hold over 16,000 fans and you'd see a packed house quite often. Their main guy was Tiny Archibald, a future Hall of Famer, an extremely exciting player who everyone wanted to see. Until he got traded, as they weren't seeing much team success with him and wanted some fresh new faces. Over time, however, the attendance and revenue would stagnate. By the 1982-83 season, they only averaged about 8,000 fans per game, half as much as they used to, and they ranked 17th out of all 23 teams in attendance. By 1983, that's when everything started to change. An investment group from Sacramento purchased the Kansas City Kings. The group would be called CCM and L. The spokesman of this group would be Greg Lukenbill, who talked about purchasing the team and stated that they don't intend to move it. We're looking for an improved record, we're looking for improved attendance and an improvement financially. It's a business investment for us. We're here because of the NBA collective bargaining agreement. Basketball's got only one way to go at this point, and that's straight up. So the ownership group who previously led the Kings was headed by Leon Karrison. Now, here's where the controversy starts. When Karrison sold the team to this new group, he made a public statement to Kansas City and its fans, saying, I want to emphasize that we are not selling the team with the idea that it be moved. They have assured us that their goal is to provide a quality NBA operation in Kansas City, with continued improvement on the playing floor as their primary goal. While the previous owner intended to keep the team in Kansas City, the new owners had a different idea. But that idea had to wait. Right now, they have to remain in Kansas. Previously, the former owner signed a two-year lease with the Kansas City Council to continue to play games at Kemper Arena until the summer of 1985. After that two-year lease expires, things were about to get spicy. But we'll get to that later. So what happened was, one month after the team got sold, in July of 1983, a Kansas City council member named Frank Palermo claimed that the new owners were planning to build a new arena in Sacramento, with the intentions of moving there after this two-year lease expired in 1985. This caught everyone by surprise. Almost immediately, Lukenbill and the new ownership group denied this, vehemently. 
However, there's another guy in this whole situation who I haven't yet mentioned. His name is Joe Axelson, the King's general manager. Shortly after Palermo made that accusation, Axelson made this public statement. I am disappointed that I am forced to refute irresponsible statements made by Palermo in this second-handed way. People like Palermo who sit back and say the kings are leaving will find it a self-fulfilling prophecy if they don't wise up and try to help us instead of hurt us. <laughs> wow, that, uh, that sounded like a threat. Like, if Kansas City doesn't help them, whatever that means, then the kings will leave? People weren't aware of this before, but now they are. Axelson wanted the team to move to Sacramento. Since he used to live in California, he wanted to move back there, so he was silently supporting this relocation. Despite his efforts to suppress this news, it was too late. Palermo's comments about the Kings building a new stadium in Sacramento already made the headlines in the local Kansas City newspaper. And the thing is, he turned out to be right. This created even more outrage. Axelson was a very unpopular GM to begin with. Kings fans did not like him. He's been a complete bozo at building their team. And now, he's supporting this relocation to Sacramento too? Oh man. At this time, he was probably the most hated GM in the history of the NBA. Additionally, Lukenville added on targets and thresholds that the city needs to meet for the team to stay. Things like, you know, reaching a certain number of fans in attendance, or reaching a certain number of wins or playoff appearances. In fact, shortly after this whole debacle, the Kings' attendance numbers skyrocketed. From roughly 8,000 fans per game to 13,000 per game, because these fans desperately wanted to keep their team. However, all those targets and goals, it was all fluff. This new ownership, along with the GM, they never intended to stay, regardless. All of these target numbers that the owners set, they were all irrelevant. The only reason they said all of this was to make the fans feel more comfortable, so that they won't protest or riot, because it was on the verge of happening. As the summer of 1985 started to get closer and closer, it was looking more and more like the Kings were gonna leave. It's basically a fact at this point. The Kansas City Council was panicking. The lease was about to expire and they gravely wanted the team to stay. They made it clear that they would do whatever it takes to get the team to stay. But the new owners already made up their minds. The city council threw multiple offers at them. Everything from a share of the city's revenue to a reduction in the costs of leasing. They literally tried everything. At one point, they even offered to charge the Kings just $1 per year to lease their arena. They knew that if the team left, it would drastically hurt the city's local economy. Thousands of jobs will be lost, millions of tax dollars will be lost, and it's very unlikely an NBA team will return to Kansas in the near future. And honestly, they were right. As of now, it's been nearly 40 years later and Kansas still doesn't have an NBA team. And so by January of 1985, the relocation process officially started. The announcement was made that the 1984-85 season would be the last season they would play in Kansas City. At the time, the general reactions were that of uneasiness and sorrow. A lot of hardcore fans continued to attend their games until the end of the season. Fans continued to fight for the team to stay, organizing rallies on the streets and calling for Joe Axelson's head. Everyone felt like that him and the entire ownership group gaslighted the entire city so hard. That was completely true. Eventually, Axelson did come out and admit his wrongdoings. The relocation of the Kings had such a monumental impact across not just the NBA but all sports. It was a story of deception and betrayal an entire city was lied to, was told to keep supporting their team and buying tickets, and given false hope that there was a chance they could help their team stay, even if there wasn't. The United States Congress was even brought in to address the issue. They tried to pass a bill that would force all major sports teams to be approved by the federal government before relocating. Though, this bill would not pass. In the future, we've seen more NBA franchises relocate in the same manner, while burning all bridges with its previous city. The Sonics' relocation to OKC was another major topic of discussion, and probably the one you were thinking about. I did make a video about that a long time ago. As for Kansas City, I'm not sure when or if they'll ever get another NBA franchise. I think there's a couple of cities ahead of them in the race. 
I'm thinking like Las Vegas, Seattle, Vancouver. There's a lot of options out there now. Hopefully, one day, they will get another NBA team. Anyway, that's all folks. That sums up the history behind the Kings relocation from Kansas City to Sacramento. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section. What do you think will be the next city to get an NBA team? I don't think it's gonna be Kansas City, but what are your thoughts? Thank you all so much for watching, I hope y'all enjoyed the video, and of course, as always, I'll see you next time. Peace.